Cool. All right. Um, did everyone see my screen okay? Oh man, Savi, it took his camera off right before I needed a thumbs up. I will assume Zoom is working nominally and you all can see my screen. That's right. Perfect. Um, amazing. Let's get this going. Uh, welcome everyone to another iteration of Hero Monthly Developer Calls. Uh, these have been incredible forums the last couple months for ecosystem devs and engineers to get together, swap learnings, kind of share case studies have been some of my favorite segments, people, uh, founders or builders um, explaining the life cycle of their uh, platform or their product, and some casual conversation too, just some Q&A, uh, finger on the pulse of the Stacks ecosystem, how it's going, how development is going, what projects are popping off, what engineers are making waves, um, and highlighting a little bit of the contributors that have touched uh, various GitHub repos and spent their valuable time hacking away and kind of completing pseudo bounties of sorts and brushing up the, the GitHub repos. So today's agenda, we always talk a little bit about purpose, shout out and thanks to some of our contributors, and then we're getting right into community topics because we have six today to get through. Purpose of this call, you've heard it once, you'll hear it again, reinforce our developer delight obsession. Developer delight is a concept at Hero that like engineering shouldn't suck. You know, it should be fun and enjoyable and gratifying when you reach the finish line. So we want to instill that developer delight. Using this call, we engage with the developer community. We also want to inspire, I was talking about this case studies, I think people discussing use cases, case studies on this call is a really great show don't tell demonstrative way of showing how you can use hero tools, how you can build products on stacks. Um, and last but not least, we're going to listen to your needs and always be improving DevEx and user experience. Little shout out to our contributors over the last month. Brieger, as always, was doing big things in the Stacks.js repo with uh, profile types and exporting them for devs. Uh, and Bowtie Deplor Deployer also touched Stacks.js. And over on the clarinet side, Locara666, sign of the beast. This dude is a beast at doing GitHub PRs and issues. Um, huge thank you to the, these three contributors who are uh, messing around in Hero repos. Always stay tuned to the Hero GitHub. There's opportunities there. And it also says like great first issue if you're a beginner hacker. So we have arrived. Like I said, we have six guests today on the call. We're gonna tear through these segments as fast as possible, but I didn't wanna cut any of them because they're all so interesting and relevant right now. We are gonna dive in with the very first one, do we have Luis on the call to talk a little bit about BNS? I was on the forum and I saw an awesome post pop up with some hardcore technical thinking on how we can improve things on the blockchain. And it was authored by Luis. He also suggested um, Frieger and Nick uh, from Gamma, I believe, uh, as kind of um, co-panelists that could add some input. So guys, take it away. We'd love to hear uh, what's going on in BNS and, and where your heads are at with uh, where we could take it in the future. Hello guys, and uh, this is Lewis. I uh, I don't know if Nick is preacher or in the call, but uh, yeah, hopefully they are. But I don't want to take the credit for it. I'm just more so a coordinator. I coordinated the post, and it was a team effort from various parties. But in a nutshell, I'm gonna summarize it super quick. So currently, if you buy your domain name, it's you go to that bdc.us and then you should not own a domain name yet, right? And then in order for you to purchase one. But this particular instance is creating a lot of customer queries and not really the best user experience because it's not really put out there that you can only own one domain name per one address. So if you look at um, our Discord now, there's just a lot of, uh, what I call this, like queries about the specific topic. And then if we trace back, this was con this conversation was actually brought up two years ago, and we haven't made a, you know, we haven't made up our mind as an ecosystem on how do we want to move forward BNS. But I think now is the time because it's like one of the core infrastructure that should be set in stone, right? Because by the end of the day, if you compare it to Web two, the first thing that you do as a user is to get a username. But why are we actually making it so difficult for a user to get a username? I don't get it. Maybe they can chime in more on 
the voice because he actually gave a specific bullet points on how we can build a better user experience and how he thinks eliminating the difficulty of registering multiple domain names could actually be the best path to move forward for BNS, similar to what they're doing on E. It's Nick in the call. Nick Spider from oh, Gala. Yeah, I, I am here. here. Sorry, I was struggling with my uh, with my mic. Um, yeah, I think um, I, I think like the the one name per address is definitely uh, like a a big uh, like UX limitation, and uh, I would say like so that we don't uh, like belabor this point that I that I think uh, it seems as though like pretty much everyone uh, you know uh, with with the you know the dev skills to do so uh, kind of seem on board now with getting rid of this limitation of one per address. I don't want to speak for everyone, but if you take a look at the forum, uh, it, it pretty much uh, seems to have um, you know uh, almost universal support. There's a few people that uh, that are that are against it, but um, but I think beyond that, there are like a handful of other uh, considerations that should be. Kind of like resolved uh, when we make such like a massive uh, upgrade to something like so critical to the actual protocol itself. Like BNS is not owned by anyone. Uh, it requires a SIP to actually you know make a change to it. So it's ideally we don't do this like every three months or something like that. Um, so I I just have a short list of things that you know I think probably should be at least considered to be included. And then maybe Friedger can speak a little bit about uh, the technical side of it, and then we'll probably move on to others because uh, we don't want to steal the, the whole time. So uh, in my mind, at least a few of the things that I've been hearing from the community um, as important ads, number one, of course, removing this one per address limit is, is a big one. Um, another being uh, some kind of... Uh, and again, Friedrich could speak to this better. I might be using the wrong words, but some kind of like mapped directory of addresses and their owners. Because right now you're relying on, you know, like APIs that uh, have historically had issues like with sometimes maybe returning like the prior owner of the address or, uh, and, and it's like kind of, uh, you know, subject to like um, flaws in indexing and things like that. So I think if there was some kind of like, uh, uh, um, better way of handling that, that would, that would probably be a good ad. Um, another being um, the ability to just add like associated addresses from other chains. So if you want to associate an ETH address uh, to be able to do that within, uh, within that, and that's to, to uh, Lewis's point, um, like ENS playbook, they have some features like that. Um, and then, uh, and then the last two, uh, one being uh, adding Unicode support because right now we only support like English characters. We don't support non-English characters. We also don't support uh, emojis. We don't support lots of things that are that are you know popular on uh, on ETH and, and elsewhere. I think even just from the standpoint of not being an English-speaking only centered blockchain, it just makes sense that we would support uh, non um, uh, you know other types of characters supported by Unicode. Um, that being said, because we don't have Unicode support, people have taken matters into their own hands and have started registering Punicode, uh, which is a, another way of rendering Unicode uh, in DNS. So if you put in uh, you know, a Punicode into DNS, like a website address, it'll render into Unicode. Um, so this is causing like a lot of kind of weirdness and the longer we go without a solution the more um problems i think it will cause because about 10 percent of all bns names are now registered with punicode and now we kind of need to decide as an ecosystem how are we going to handle the transition uh to support of unicode do we leave the punicode registrants in the dust do we find a way for them to burn and mint a unicode version do we make Unicode and Punicode equal and you can't register both? Um, it's, I guess my whole point is to say uh, lots of like things are being caused by this like legacy way of doing things the way that we did do it. So it, it makes sense that we prioritize finding solutions uh, pretty quickly. And then the final thing, and I'll turn it over to Friedger, is uh, whatever path we choose, 
uh, it probably would make sense that we involve some kind of way to upgrade this uh, on an ongoing basis, perhaps using like Executor DAO or something like that, um, such that like we can make changes without having to do SIPs every single time. Um, so anyway, rambling for a while, Friedger, on to you. <laughs> yes, hello. Um, first point I think is that getting a, a name for a new user is really easy. Um, the, the problem is getting more names for traders at the moment, I guess. The, that's the, the most use case or the, the uh, asking for traders are asking for this. Um, I, I see there's a use case that you want to have several names on uh, because they are similar or they, they relate to the same thing, but um, mainly the name should be used to identify your profile. So uh, if how many GitHub handles do you have? Uh, do you want to have more than one and refer to them to the same repo? I don't know, or to your collection, so your, your own Git profile. <clears throat> so there, there's a good reason why there's a one-to-one -one mapping. And also in Ethereum, you have the one primary address. <clears throat> Therefore, or one primary name. Uh, therefore, I think if we want to have, uh, we, we need to be clear what problem we want to solve. And um, we can implement something like secondary names. Uh, that's, I, I, I think that's possible if you want that. Um, I, and if you read the history about the discussion one-to-one -one names, uh, the, the, for the user, it should be clear that if you log in, uh, to an application with your name, you arrive at a particular place. And if you uh, register two names, it can happen that you arrive at a different place or something like that. Uh, so then um, what were all the other points? I can't remember. But uh, yeah, technically, I think a zip is good. We need to have some kind of uh, a list of requirements, what we want to achieve, and then implementation shouldn't be too difficult. Uh, the issue with APIs, yeah, um, there is, is a low level API, API where you can retrieve your name. So the question is whether we just fix the hero API or we switch to this lower level. So there's technical solutions. Um, yeah, I think. Yeah. Then nice. What else was there? The yeah. I, well, I think the main thing that we need to do is come up with uh, a proposal of what we want to achieve and then just implement it. Yeah. Well, we have seen that pattern happen in the Stacks ecosystem. Yeah. You know. <laughs> A lot of great conversation and uh, GitHub um, comments. I would recommend everyone go and and read this forum post and all the responses and and all the engineers chiming in. A lot of great like technical um, dis discussion on technical Venn diagrams. What different uh, implementations achieve what goals? Um, appreciate all you going around the horn there. I totally agree on some of that stuff, uh, it, it, taking the, the best from ENS and their playbook. But even, you know, ENS is imperfect as a, as a retail consumer. It's confusing to see the like the parent, the registrant, the controller, the reverse registrant, and, and we uh, can build a better solution, you know. And I can see the desire for multiple names under like a single principle. Um, if anyone missed it, uh, Ryder uh, unveiled, unleashed the Ryder community handles. And if you want to be a part of multiple DAOs, multiple uh, tokenized communities, having that ability um, would be beneficial. But uh, I like the caveats that that you express, Frieger, on that. It's not just, it's sensitive, you know, it's not just throw as many names in a single address as you can. Um, awesome. Do you guys have any final closing thoughts on BNS before everyone rushes off to read the forum post and get in touch with uh, the latest in BNS? 
I think just contribute. I think that's what we can do. I think right now the community of stacks is such in a good place because everybody has a voice, right? Everybody could literally say, yeah, we want this. Let's go. <laughs> you know, so if you want to contribute, join the forum post. We also have a working group, BNS working group on the Discord. So if you want to get involved and just like steer the ship, come join the party with your stacks crew. And that's it. Amazing. Okay. You you know if Muneeb is commenting on a forum post that it's a big deal and you should, should probably go check it out. Um, for okay. the sake of time, I think we're going to move on. Okay. Appreciate all you guys and your attention and attendance here today um, and all the work you do out in the stacks. Lord knows BNS isn't the only thing uh, you three are touching, so appreciate your time. Moving on to Grant's goodies. We have our friend Will from the Stacks Foundation on today. Um, I think he might even have some slides of his own. Let's see if I successfully gave him permission to share. Oh, I did it. Nice. Uh, thanks for joining us, Will. Excited to hear some Grant's updates. Take her away. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Joe. Hi, everyone. Um, so this will just be pretty top level and then um, there's a call to action at the end but <clears throat> let me move some of the stuff out of the way so in short you know the grants program is one of uh, you know several programs that are championed by the stacks foundation and the stacks foundation is the nonprofit uh part of the the stacks ecosystem that's focused on utilizing programming and community outreach to help champion, you know, and support developers building a more user-owned and open source internet powered by Stacks and secured by Bitcoin. And so through those different programs, uh, there's what I like to call this spectrum of support. So there's several different types of grants and other programs that you can be involved with um, to gain some monetary support and, you know, help advance the trajectory of your career and, and hopefully like build some great stuff and build great community on stacks. And so that ranges everything from small community grants, chapter grants, and then, uh, you know, gets up to like more of the developer grants, which uh, is the primary focus of what we're, uh, the grants program is directed right now. And so with uh, that in mind, where you start is by going to grants.stacks.org. And from there, there's uh, an application pipeline that allows you to submit an application for really any one of those types of grants, whether it be a community grant, an event grant, chapter, uh, residency, um, or an open source developer grant. And once you submit that application, that will that kind of concludes what you do on grants.stacks.org. And then the rest of the life cycle exists on the grants GitHub repo. So the pipeline allows us to like kind of format the grants in a uniform way. So they're easy to read and easy for us to review and, and sort of uh, gives us the ability to onboard grants in a good way. But then really all the magic happens on GitHub. That's where all the de you know, developers are. That's uh, the connection to the, the dev community. And so we leverage uh, GitHub, you know, their built-in wiki we use for our docs and our guidelines. Uh, the built-in issues is those issues are, are a little more unique than issues in a normal repo because those are like applications for grants. And then on projects, you can see a, a Kanban board view of the applications and grants in process. Um, and then under discussions, there's uh, opportunity to join different discussions. And, you know, I guess probably the number one place I, I want to draw your attention to on the repo is either on the, the very home page on our code or on the first page of the docs under wiki, you'll find the current grant program priorities. And so we really are trying to, um, you know, find strong alignment between the, the efforts that all the great people at Hero, all the great people at, you know, Gamma, at Trust Machines, at all of these stack steps around the ecosystem, the core engineers at the foundation, um, what they're all working on in terms of these amazing unlocks with Stacks 2.1, with subnets, with um, SBTC. 
you know, we want to make sure that we are, you know, putting funds, you know, deploying funds in a way that they're going to make the most good. And so uh, we really want to focus our efforts on, you know, anything that's going to leverage uh, Stacks 2.1 upgrades and subnets, anything that's going to like strengthen the connection between Bitcoin and Stacks. And then uh, also just as important, anything that's just going to help the overall uh, developer, you know, developer resources and developer tooling and environment, uh, you know, on stacks, that's going to either help support the developers that are already here or encourage more developers to come. And then same for founders. And um, so within the, the whole repo, you, you know, you'll find like, I could bore you with all the details about the do's and do nots of grant, you know, applications and things like that, but uh, I will leave it to you to go through and, and just kind of read all the details. So under process and payments, you can learn all about the phases of an application, any payment considerations, um, how to craft an application. And then there's application templates. So you can like just take a Google doc, you know, save it, draft up your application uh, over a period of time rather than in the application form. Um, you can get into all the minute details and the terms and conditions that they use. And then went through, I think we have to date like 400 and actually, this is kind of fun, 420 um, applications that we've ever received approved and denied and went through and tagged all of those applications. So. They've all been tagged as like five different labels that refer to the type of grant, the status of the grant, the track of the grant, number of payments. And so it's easy for you to find, uh, okay, what's been rejected in this area that I'm interested in? So I could like try to avoid those or what's already been completed so I can try and complement those or who should I reach out to and what repos can I look at? So I think that's a really great resource. And then also compiled all 170 grants that we have awarded, which is almost approaching 4.5 million in funding. And uh, so those are collated in lists by cohort and also by grant track. So you can see, you know, approximately every six to eight weeks for awarding a cohort. And so you can go through the history of the grant program and see you know, who was awarded when, and then there's also eight grant tracks. So areas of interest basically, and you can find the grants that are complementary to subjects that you're interested in. <clears throat> and so with cohorts um, in mind, here are the, the cohorts that we just awarded. This was cohort 18 um, that was awarded uh, last day of October, uh, or sorry, last day of September. And then we're going to award cohort 19 applications close uh, November 4th. And then applications will or they'll be awarded, I think, uh, November 23rd, just before the holidays. Um, so you, know, you can see it's like kind of across the spectrum, but still like really working on those uh, priorities that were identified earlier. And then the last thing, the call to action that I just want to put in front of you, and Joe's going to link to these, um, or wish list grants. So Frieger, who's on this call, prolific. I think he's definitely number one on the grant leaderboard. I went through every application. I've got it all tallied up. I believe Frieger has the most applications from earlier in the day, which is great. A lot of those were high impact wish list grants, which are different than a normal grant where a, a normal grant is, hey, I've got an idea, I wanna apply for it, I wanna do it. A wish list grant is, hey, I see a need that needs to be filled. I'm gonna submit like an idea, which is like a bounty or a request for proposals. And that's gonna make its way onto the wish list. And then anyone in the community can buy for uh, being awarded that work so that they take it on. So. You might see something that's really great dealing with BNS that you don't have the time to do, but you submit it to a wish list grant and we'll find someone that can do it. So we're really trying to reboot that whole program. And so there's a one pager that will go through all the details of how that process is going to work. And then a survey, you know, we're, we're starting this whole like flywheel of ideas by just seeding it. Kenny, our developer advocate had several ideas that he had running. Uh, we 
added that to a list along with a couple of other community contributed ideas. And that's the start of the survey. So really just trying to get some feedback, some input on the viability of those ideas, how much you know money would you allocate to something like that? And then also give us your one great wish list idea. And then we will be going through the process of pulling all that together and releasing the first batch of wishlist grants, uh, hopefully just early December. And so the goal is to award between 500,000 to a million dollars in wishlist grants alone in the next three quarters. <laughs> I love it, Jeff. That's it. Thank you. Amazing. Oh my gosh. Is this the romantic comedy love actually? Because you're giving out some <laughs> huge grants, huge, huge grants. And it's, it's a webinar. That, that, that was, that was no really good. That was unmute and laugh at me. <laughs> All right, let me share my screen and we're going to move on to the next segment. Will, cannot thank you enough for coming on, giving us your time. So much going on in grants. Check out all the links I post in the chat to the grants launch pad, um, the wish list, the forum post recently mm -hmm. outlining some of the changes. Lots of happenings over there. And I had to copy his slide again because this just blows my mind that this much uh, capital is being flown around in our space right now. Next up, we have Hero Developer Survey results, the most anticipated drop of 2022. Um, Hero recently ran its developer survey, and Brian is here to talk a little bit about the results and some of the takeaways that the data is telling us. Brian, you out there? I am here. Thank you, Joe. Um, if I could share my screen, that would be great. So quick hello to everyone. I am Brian. I joined the Hero product marketing team about three months ago. So pretty new and uh, really excited to share with you today the results from our developer survey. So first and foremost, hopefully you've heard, but we did run a developer survey and, and thank you to all who participated. It, it really helps us out as we plan for the next coming quarters and year. So in this deck, we will go over the overview of the responses, uh, some customer effort scores, and then some different preferences and demographic information. So we could not have done this alone. Thank you so much to the developer community and to everyone's support in the ecosystem, including partners like the Foundation, Trust Machines, Accelerator, Clarity Bootcamp. Uh, truly, thank you all for, for the help. We have 267 total responses, which is slightly down from Q1, but we're not worried about that. That is uh, uh, fine by us. It's over one fourth of the monthly average traffic to docs.hero, and it's double the estimate for our monthly active developers. And the survey captures perspectives from developers around the world. As you can see, 50 countries were represented and actually more in Asia Pacific than just the US. So definitely a good spread across the globe. Uh, and it also grabs a perspective from people from different orgs within the Stacks ecosystem. And so this quarter, we succeeded in not only qu quantity, but also the quality of responses. We'll get more into the demo information in a bit. We have just a general picture of our developer community here for you. So 85% are male, so it's mostly males developing in the Stacks ecosystem for less than a year with 57% in the ecosystem for less than 12 months. And 75% of the total is aged between 25 and 44. So now that we know a little bit about that, let's take a look and see what they actually said. So the customer effort score is just how difficult or easy it is for customers to use our product. And this is where we ask about the developer lifecycle questions. And I'll the next slide will show it a little more granularly, but overall, we're really satisfied with this. The average is a is a 7.2, which is up 10% from Q1 or just under 10% from Q1. And as we move forward, we can see each step of the process uh, in the developer lifecycle spelled out a little bit more. And as you can see, three of these areas had double digit growth, while all of them in total still grew from Q1 to Q3. So super exciting. And we're, we're really happy to see that our improvements are, are making it easier for developers to do their job. So now as we go into our cohorts, this is kind of how we, we looked at it and decided to break it down. And we used one specific question. It's whether developers identified themselves as professional developers, occasional developers, or hobbyists. 
And so you can see the split is 35% said that I am a professional software developer. 21% said that I am not primarily a developer, but as part of my profession, I occasionally write code. And then 36% are consider, consider themselves student or a coding hobbyist. Uh, and then we wanted to see how many of them were affiliated with the Stacks organization and 35% are affiliated with one or more of the Stacks organizations. And those include Clarity Bootcamp, Stacks Accelerator, Stacks Grant Recipients, Fungible Systems, Mechanism, and Trust Machines. So there, there was really no clear delineation between which cohort and which organization stood out. So it's a good mix across the entire group. And as we try and understand our cohorts a little further, we, we asked a question around areas of specialization. We saw that web development was the most popular category, followed by front end, back end, and full stack were all tied. The most popular subcategories after that were gaming, desktop, and engineering management. Then we took these groups and asked them follow-up questions. And so 117 responses on employment status, 73% said that they were either full-time, part-time, or self-employed in Web3. And while 21% are employed, but not in Web3. And then we broke it down a little further, asking about the category of the projects that they're working on. We had 66 developers answer this question. And as you can see, NFTs and DAOs led the way at 38 and 18% respectively. And those were the most popular answers in both the Q3 survey and the Q1 survey that was run earlier this year. So let's dive a little deeper into their preferences and demographics. And if you have questions, please drop them in the chat. I apologize that I'm going quick. I just want to be cognizant of time. So we asked the ever important question of what Web3 ecosystems are you currently involved in? Stacks obviously came out on top. Bitcoin as well was up top. Uh, we don't have uh, answers to look at from Q1 because of the way the question was worded, but you can see that the answers below all do have a change and that Cosmos and Lightning are more popular this quarter than in the beginning of the year with 85 and 64% growth respectively. And then Polygon, Avalanche, Polkadot, and Binance Smart Chain all had a drop off. Uh, the question is why? And that's what we're going to start digging into over the next couple months. And so we wanted to see some motivations and some of the values of, of our developer community. And one of the questions we asked was, the bear market has blank my desire to work, so increase, decrease, or no effect. And great news, 55% of folks that answered said that is increased their desire to work in Web3. No impact had 30% and 15% was decreased, so it really does prove that bears are for builders. The we asked also about their primary motivation for de developing on the Stacks ecosystem. 38% uh, said that Bitcoin innovation was, was their main motivator, while 30% mentioned the Stacks community. And I think this call and, and some of the things that have been mentioned are a really good point to, to show that the strength or show the strength of this community, excuse me. And then we asked about another fun question of what is the most important part of the blockchain trilemma, decentralization, security, or scalability? Decentralization was the clear winner. 60% of developers said that that was the most important part. And the last one, what is your attitude towards the term Bitcoin maximalist? 59% of developers said that it was a neutral term. And really what this means is that it just means something different to everyone, um, which we're totally fine with. We, we understand that not everyone has the same definition for everything. The final slide here shows a couple different things. It just shows how long developers have been in the Stack ecosystem in the top left. That tells us that we're retaining developers. Um, so time in the ecosystem, 40% of respondents have been building on Stacks for over 12 months, and that's up 27% from Q1. And then we, we asked about how they heard about Stacks. And while word of mouth is a strong influence for our developer community. The marketing efforts throughout the Hero ecosystem or the Stacks ecosystem, excuse me, have not gone unnoticed. With forty-six percent of developers saying they heard about Stacks from social media, a blog post, or a virtual or in-person event. 
And that is my time. Thank you all so much. And Joe, I'll pass the floor back over to you. Awesome. Thank you for giving us that little sneak peek. Wow, that hero marketing department. Who's on that team? Um, uh, it's really everyone, though. Uh, all of the foundation cohorts and accelerator, all the resources that have been published. And I attribute a lot to like the sub communities, too, and friends and Savita Guild and all these new smaller subgroups that are forming. A lot of interesting takeaways, great uh, score on customer satisfaction. Shame to hear about like the demographic and the dominance of male developers in the communities. We see some awesome like women-led groups on Ethereum. There's SheFi or Boys Club that are women-led and, and totally focused on like promoting the technology to new audiences, new groups of, uh, of women around the tech space. And I would love to see um, groups like that spin up in the Stacks ecosystem soon. All right. We are running out of time here, so we got to go, 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 go. However, our friend Hero Gamer has to depart right at 1 p.m., and I'm sensing we might run a little over. So I would like to jump to him for one moment just to give a quick, quick heads up about the SIP community calls. That one is actually happening tomorrow. You're going to get a sneak peek of the rest of the call here. Oh, there it was. All right, SIP Community Call. Here, you want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, sure. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, so actually, it's like the BNS situation. So it's actually a SIP. Well, hopefully, it will be a SIP. Um, yeah, so every week, um, we meet up and we talk about everything SIP. And in case, well, hopefully everybody here knows that stack 2.1 is also a big sip basically um so uh we are lucky to have jude uh there in most of all the sessions so yeah it's where we inform people about what's going on specifically in the sip area and it's quite critically important because um sip does uh, as improvement proposals is everything related to the blockchains or the governance. So it's actually a pretty key infrastructure to, to Stacks. So we want to have like the good brains in the sessions. We want to have good discussions um, such as the BNS stuff. You know, we, it's, it's often we talk about lots of ideas, but it's a little bit hard to define what the actual problem we're trying to solve. So hopefully through these sessions that people can come in. If they have ideas about a SIP or group of people, uh, in fact, in the next couple of weeks, I'm trying to invite the BNS guys uh, onto the call so we can actually have, and now uh, what, I, what I do is I tend to ask the, the guests who would like, they'd like to have on too. So I can really get, I reach out to those people and get those uh, close stakeholders together and they can actually have a productive discussions. So it's a place to inform the, the whole of the community what's going on underneath the hood um, because it tends to sort of be hidden in GitHub and be hidden in Stacks forums. But when you actually look at the actual number of uh, average uh, Stacks users, really like uh, nine out of 10 don't have GitHub account or they don't even go on Stacks forum. So how do we bring this information to them? So I try to leverage Twitter to amplify these sessions, trying to invite people. So we actually have a pretty decent number of people coming onto the calls, like on a weekly to week basis, like we're getting like between 20 to 30 people every week and it's only getting more. So yes, it's a it's a session to really inform the whole of Stacks community, whether you're a user or builders uh, or developers or core devs, um, and to educate people. These things exist, and these things are critical um, to the running of the Stacks blockchain inside or outside the blockchain. And there's a a very um, robust process that uh, goes in to hopefully vet through these um, um, SIPs. 
for the for the community or at least advise on them for the community so uh yes yeah, so anybody who want to advocate if anybody on this call has any ideas about how um if you have an idea about a new standard for like communication between different stuff like like this is a place where you can come in and you can get some really good feedback because we have many technical people we have different people from different you know governance uh lens from economics lens like it can really help you and help you to take the next action so we want to make it as supportive as possible and as productive as possible, but also informative as possible. Um, so, yeah, so I hold that basically every week. Um, whether it looks like tomorrow you have Jude and Gina on to talk about um, the steering committees and stuff. Yes. So um, end of the last Friday of each month. Um, the steering committee um, basically gives an overview of what's gone on uh, in the past month and what's coming in the near future. And so, yeah, the SIP process itself, which is just the process how from a SIP idea to when it becomes ratified um, in the end, the whole process itself involves several key groups, um, such as SIP editors, um, the consideration advisory boards and the steering committees. So the 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 top of the food chain, if you like, uh, the steering committee uh, will and it's it's only it's it's fairly new. So Jude has always been like um, in SIP, as SIP editor, acting as SIP editors, um, cap members, and also the steering committee. But the hope is that by including uh, more people from the community that this um, process of uh, vetting the SIP can be more and more decentralized over time. So we are not just relying on the good advice of the core developers to bring new ideas. We want to have people from the community like Fridger. So uh, we have a guy um, from Bitcoin Badger called Zetsus. In fact, he has an idea about uh, how do we make a non-custodial staking easier in stacks and which is even like a better implementation than other chains. So um, yeah, so he can come on. We want more and more uh, contributors from the community. And and in fact, this Sessus guy touching on Wales program um, went through the foundation's uh, grants program and received the grant based on his idea. So it is a pretty collaborative process and uh, we want to encourage as much involvement from the community uh, organically generated. Uh, we don't want in two years, three years time, we still have to heavily rely on the core devs to come up with these uh, new core improvements. Hopefully, we have other people through grants program or just by on their project, they come up with something that they can uh, participate and have their voice heard about how stacks should move forward. Yeah, don't get me wrong. <clears throat> Jude is amazing, but imagine if we had a hundred Judes and a hundred Freegers in the GitHub just going through <laughs> all the issues. Um, I think that's what these types of calls are are striving to create. And yeah, you you deserve a lot of credit for just, I think, like catalyzing the community a bit. We felt some fragmentation a couple months back, I think around like Bitcoin Unleashed in Miami. And I think it's safe to say that I, I can feel that fragmentation diminishing rapidly with these steering committees, the SIP community calls, um, all the entities working together on, on doing various things, seeing the trust machines booth across the aisle at Masari Mainnet. It really does feel like a, a collectivism uptick recently. Um, Thank you so much for coming on, Hero Gamer. I'm so sorry. I think I got to move to the next segment. I overscheduled this call, but I'm loving all the updates. Um, 
Thank you for everything you do. Also, all the Discord moderator uh, gauntlets that you go through, I'm sure. Um, and thank you for giving us your time today. Thank you. All right, what's next? We're going on back to Stacks 2.1, new keywords and functions. It's already been said on the call, Stacks 2.1 is the next big thing. And Maxime, a developer advocate from Hero, is here to pop the hood on it a little bit and give you a sneak peek. It's a teaser trailer on uh, some of the upcoming Clarity upgrades. Yeah, hey everyone, um, Max or Maxime, there are two Maxes at Hero, um, Max Crawford over at Content and, and Max Efremov here, developer advocate. Um, I met some of you, um, I work with external developers, learn their pain points in the course of developing Stacks applications. And then uh, I help try to steer as best I can um, uh, product development inside Hero. So um, Stacks 2.1 is coming out uh, at the end of this year, roughly. Um, and so by the way, um, uh, both one, a lot of this content exists uh, at this mechanism blog post, which I'm going to go over briefly. You can read a lot of it there. And then the other point I want to make is uh, all of this is pending uh, Stacks 2.1 release. A lot of the stuff is pretty firm, uh, you know, pull requests accepted, um, a lot of stuff already kind of like uh, baked into uh, the release and none of it's live until it's live. So, you know, just heads up on that. Um, so I'm going to be going over a lot of the changes happening to Clarity. Um, but primarily some of the uh, uh, keywords and methods that are being added, some of the global variables, um, uh, the theme, the themes of which are uh, basically enhancing, um, yeah, like uh, global variables, um, Bitcoin read access, uh, making it easier to, um, yeah, uh, track state changes in Bitcoin uh, and create um, stacks related uh, applications. And um, I'm going to go over briefly the uh, the best, um, most opinionated uh, walkthrough, which is this mechanism blog post. I'm going to go over super briefly. If you want to go to the next slide, um, you'll see here, these are new uh, keywords, uh, methods that are uh, going to be included now in uh, what we're calling Clarity 2. Um, uh, you know, uh, sponsoring transactions. So now Clarity smart contract applications can actually have users that sign a transaction, but then the transaction fee is paid by another third party. Um, Stuff like, um, uh, you know, testing is really important, making sure that, um, you know, you have parts of your smart contract that may only be live if you're on mainnet. Um, you know, new um, uh, um, methods to convert uh, data types, also to uh, read them, slice them, just some some stuff that is like uh, pretty handy. And we found out, we got a lot of feedback in the course of the year and a half or so that Clarity One has been live. You know, the next slide. Um, just a, a couple more things, um, comparators. Now we can compare not just um, uh, integers, but also strings and buffers. Uh, the, the SDX transfer with memo, this was really important. Um, uh, the passing a memo for multiple SDX transfers uh, wasn't included natively. We kind of hacked together a solution, but here's now a like um, a performant uh, clarity native way to do that. Um, and then, yeah, the, the principle of keyword, here you'll be able to um, actually uh, take the uh, principle that from a hashed uh, public address, just you know, kind of reducing the number of steps that uh, people were were doing um, uh, before some of these keywords were ca uh, came out. So this is all covered in that blog post, which in just a minute I'm going to share. You go to the next slide. Um, I did go through the uh, SIP uh, 15, I believe which is where a lot of the Stacks 2.1 um, changes are being kind of discussed and, and, and published under. Uh, and I just grabbed a few more of the things that I wanted to highlight that I, I haven't seen highlighted elsewhere. Um, really importantly, there's um, going to be start uh, a clarity contract versioning uh, to kind of distinguish between some of the old contracts and um, like clarity one and clarity two uh, within the, the runtime environment. Um, this the theme of this uh, change is to basically get developers to think carefully about interoperating between new uh, keywords, new changes uh, in Clarity Two when Clarity One contracts are um, making you know API calls to these newer um, uh, contracts. So there's just going to be some like um, explicit versioning um, uh, kind of uh, imposed upon uh, developers. There's changes made to traits. Um, some surprising behavior was discovered in the course of uh, of trait types and we're creating um, changes to uh, kind of make that behavior less surprising and just more standard. 
um, principally uh, making uh, describing the trait types that traits can be handled um, like principles can be. Um, and then there's also given that uh, some dynamic dispatch changes, which I'm actually getting up to speed on myself in the course of change, uh, you know, um, playing around with the new Clarity 2 changes. And then there's also a ton more keywords. There's really a lot more I could, you know, make a list just as long as the other two slides. But um, that all of that information is contained in this link here, which I'm going to share uh, just momentarily. But it's it's a more exhaustive list of of all of the changes. And so with that, uh, I conclude, and and I believe we might have uh, one or two more um, um, people presenting. So thank you, Joe. No, thank you. Appreciate the uh, the look into the crystal ball in the future. Definitely check out the StacksGov SIPs folder on GitHub. Um, kind of keeps track of all of the SIPs. Um, but it didn't have SIPs 15 list listed, so I don't know how you found that. I love all the info in there. Um, all right, we are landing the monthly developer call plane here, but we have one more segment from our friends over at Zest. Emil, are you here? And yes, I am. Hi, nice. can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Hi, guys. So, uh, yeah, I'm I'm covering for Tyco today, and um, I'll try and keep it uh, short and sweet. But uh, actually, um, lucky for us, since uh, Tyco was meant to cover Bitcoin Amsterdam. Um, I actually wasn't in Bitcoin Amsterdam, so all I can say for that is that it probably was great and everything went fine. Um, but yeah, I can I was, was going to ask on the if, other if you went. I'll definitely give you some space to talk about the Zest testnet. Um, but yeah, there was a Bitcoin Amsterdam event last week. Uh, a bunch of the Stacks entities got together, um, just a little panel and whatnot. But I did want to share some pictures. Um, you see. The panel here, these are the Trust Machines team. Um, I believe that's Aubrey, Rena, Tycho, and Dan. And up here is Ken from Trust uh, Xverse um, and the funny uh, drink list. Here's some foundation friends. Tycho dropping the zest knowledge right there on stage. All right. And you guys launched Testnet. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, we launched Testnet. Um, we're slowly rolling out functionality to different user groups um, of the protocol, uh, as this is kind of, well, the best way for us to manage the different things that arise in terms of bugs and also make sure that everything goes chronologically. As you know, we have lending pools and uh, without first opening up the uh liquidity um functionality we wouldn't have had any liquidity in the pool to provide the loans so when we went out um the liquidity functionality was rolled out and we've got a lot of feedback got a lot of uh stuff that we're making better already which is great um and then next week or by end of next week i think we're rolling out the borrower functionality so now that the pools are being set up we'll have borrowers borrowing from these pools and we'll be funding these loans um all with bitcoin so it's uh it's been amazing it's great in terms of like the hero uh infrastructure that's involved our our primary um Actually, a lot of our infrastructure involves the chain hooks. So the chain hooks are a specific thing that uh, the hero developers, especially Ludo, um, has been and working on. And yeah, so props to Ludo because a lot of the stuff that you see on our site or that you will see once it comes up is all based off those chain hooks. So a lot of the data there and also a lot of the cross-chain functionality, we're doing some crazy stuff that's not really been done before where you know users have flows that go from the Stacks blockchain to the Bitcoin blockchain and back. Um, so there's all kinds of funky stuff going there, um, going on there. And uh, as you can imagine, also all kinds of funky stuff that can go wrong there. So that's why we're rolling it out uh, face by face, week by week, and uh, just trying to catch all the little bugs here and there and get bulletproof for mainnet. 
Um, but yeah, uh, more to come on that, obviously, as we roll out more of the functionality and happy to talk about it more later um, with Sabi and Ludo uh, or whoever else is interested. Go check it out, people. I'm logged in right now. I just logged in with my hero wallet. It's from one orange website to another. Absolutely beautiful UX. Uh, no brainer to to play around with and mess around with borrowing and delegating and and uh, clicking around to all the different modules. They also have a dedicated testnet setup guide if you've never like switched your hero wallet over to testnet. But this is it. It's time. Get in there. Break the app if you can. Uh, we need projects in the Stacks ecosystem, need beta testers, need um, uh, activity to stress test edge cases and stuff like that. Um, this is awesome. You guys made such a splash on Twitter last week and uh, I was DMing with Tycho. He was he was next level hype to kind of uh, have that big coming out party on Testnet. So um, yeah, looking forward to big things from Zest in the future for Mainnet or something like that. Thank you so much. Did we do it? Did we just get through six segments in an hour? I cannot believe it. Um, thank you so much to all of our guests. You guys know how this goes. If you want to contribute, head to the Hero Systems GitHub. If you want to check out the roadmap, Docs roadmap, um, all of the uh, links from this presentation will be added to the GitHub repo after this call. If you want to say hello more, head to stacks.chat to join the Discord. and. And if maybe you're a little spooked out this weekend, you don't want to go out, you don't want to go to any Halloween parties, the Stackathon, Heroes Stackathon, is running until the spooky day of October 31st, Halloween. So you still have this weekend to submit GitHub repos that you have um, remixed some code on or uploaded a, a smart contract, or it can be um, a wide array of, of types of projects. But get those uploaded, get it submitted to the Stackathon, and you can win hero swag. It's getting chilly out there. You know that you want to be in this hat when the snow starts falling. And now that is actually all we have. Um, thank you everyone for joining the October edition of the monthly developer calls. I hope everyone is staying warm out there as it gets a little bit chilly here in Brooklyn. But I think if there's one takeaway, so much happening right now. Go out and try out all that stuff. Go to the SIP community call tomorrow. Try out Zest. Take a look at the dev survey results. Um, a lot going on right now. Thank you for your time and attention. Hope everyone has a good weekend. I'll catch you at the next one.